Hi, I'm Jennifer Robinson with Spherix Global Insights, and I'm here today with Dr. Jay Wish from Indiana University, who is a well-known expert in renal anemia. Welcome, Dr. Wish. Thank you. So um, there's been a lot of excitement. As you know, we do a number of surveys of general nephrologists and excitement about the HIF-PH inhibitor class is really mounting. Um, but recently there've been a couple of setbacks. Um, we did see some negative clinical trial data with vatidustat in a non-dialysis setting. And the FDA review for roxidustat was extended by another three months. So let me ask you about the latter. Um, what does this extended review with roxidustat mean um, to you? Well, I, I'm not quite as pessimistic about what it signifies as a lot of other observers. Uh, it's not unusual for new drug application approvals to be delayed for a few months uh, while the FDA gathers additional information. I kind of compare it to a manuscript review uh, by peers uh, when you send it to a journal and it goes through a number of rounds of peer review and they ask for additional uh, data from the investigators. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the study was flawed. It doesn't necessarily mean that they don't believe the results of the study. It's just that they're looking for additional data to support the conclusions. And I suspect that that's what's going on with the FDA. It's certainly not as uh, draconian response is a complete response letter, which would basically postpone any approval process for the better part of a year. Uh, this is just three months, and to me, that's just a, a, a slight bump in the road. All right, great. So let, let's be optimistic, and let's assume that uh, Roxidustat will be approved um, in March. Talk to me about the, the first patients that you might try it in. Well, I'm actually excited about roxidustat as a potential alternative uh, for the treatment in my patients with both non-dialysis and dialysis-dependent chronic kidney disease. Uh, for the non-dialysis patients, I think in terms of patient friendliness, it, it really blows the ESAs away. Uh, ESAs have to be given parenterally. Uh, many patients, especially those who are on Medicare, have to come to a healthcare facility every week or two uh, to get their uh, ESA injection, that's obviously inconvenient, and certainly now in the setting of COVID and patients wanting to stay home and out of harm's way in terms of travel and mingling in waiting rooms with other patients, uh, the ability to administer an oral medication like Roxidustat at home three times a week to me is, is a much safer alternative in terms of protection from uh, the elements, if you will, uh, as well as even after COVID uh, ends, uh, as it hopefully will in the next uh, you know, six to nine months, uh, I think you know, we have a sustained advantage in terms of the ability to administer a user-friendly medication to your non-dialysis population. Non-dialysis patients don't get adequate treatment for their anemia because there are so many patient-unfriendly barriers to the administration of ESAs, which I think we will significantly overcome with the use of the oral HIF stabilizers. As far as the dialysis patients are concerned, I see two populations where the HIF stabilizers and roxidustab being the first of them uh, may be of advantage. Uh, number one would be those who fail ESA therapy, the hepo quote, hypo-responsive patients. And most dialysis units have anywhere between 10 and 20% EPO hypo-responsive patients. Uh, usually they're inflamed. They have typically the high ferritin and the low TSATs, uh, significant for functional iron deficiency. And we keep escalating the ESA dose uh, and the patients often do not achieve their target hemoglobin levels. So there you have a failure of current therapy and you clearly need a better mousetrap. And I think Roxidustat and the other hip stabilizers offer a better mechanism of action because not only do they stimulate endogenous erythropoietin production, uh, but they also help mobilize this storage iron uh, in the setting of functional iron deficiency and inflammation that ESAs don't do. So that would be the first group. The other group I would strongly consider using roxidustat is in the incident dialysis population. Uh, because the sub-analysis of the incident patients in the ROXA global phase three clinical trials indicated a safety superiority for both MACE and MACE plus versus the comparator, which was ESAs, uh, for patients that were in their first four months of dialysis at the time of initiation of the intervention. So to me, since those are the most vulnerable patients, those are the patients that are most likely to get hospitalized and to die, if you have an intervention that's equally effective in terms of raising the hemoglobin and yet more safe in terms of the adverse outcomes of morbidity and mortality, that to me would be a, a pretty clear-cut choice for the HIF stabilizer. 
So the patient populations you just described are pretty sizable. I mean, one in four patients is an incident dialysis patient starting dialysis um, in a year and 10 to 20% with EPO hypo responders. So it sounds like you're expecting them to play a pretty big role in dialysis. Well, I, I am, and that's because I'm, I'm pretty much impressed with the incident dialysis patient data uh, that was presented at uh, ASN Kidney Week this past year. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of other logistical issues. You know, is the dialysis unit protocol for the treatment of anemia going to allow me to use these agents in the incident population? You know, what is the cost of these agents? You know, ROXA has not been launched yet. We don't know how much it costs. We don't know what its cost profile is compared to, you know, current therapy with ESAs. So mm -hmm. that is a potential barrier, even though it may be outside the bundle for two years as part of the TADAPA you know, the logistical considerations of how we're going to get it into our dialysis units, whether our protocols will allow us to use it liberally in the patients that we think will benefit most, I think are questions that still need to be answered. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. I may have another question on the TVDAPA um, coming up, but if I were to ask you, what do you think the single greatest benefit of Roxadustat is? I, I think there's two, and one is okay. the oral administration. <laughs> I, I <hate> <laughs> I'll give you two. <laughs> okay. So one is the oral administration, which I see applies primarily to the non-dialysis population uh, because they don't have to come and get an injection in a, you know, in a, in a healthcare uh, facility. But the other is the coordinated erythropoiesis that you get with the hip stabilizers that you don't get with the ESAs. ESAs do one thing. They replace a single hormone, which is erythropoietin, which is deficient in patients with chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease. And, you know, we thought that that was going to solve the problem in 1989 when recombinant human erythropoietin was first launched. But we now realize 31 years later that things aren't quite that simple and that the anemia of chronic kidney disease is multifactorial. It's not just related to erythropoietin deficiency, but it's also related to inflammation and blood loss and uremic effects on the bone marrow, et cetera. And erythropoietin only addresses one of those issues. The nice thing that I see about the hip stabilizers is not only do they induce endogenous erythropoietin production at a more physiologic level than what you see with the exogenous ESAs that have the high spikes, peaks, and troughs in terms of blood erythropoietin levels, the endogenous erythropoietin production that you get with the hip stabilizers is more continuous and at a lower level, but yet it produces the same rise in hemoglobin. And as a result is a much more physiologic approach on that side. The other side is the effects of the hip stabilizers on iron metabolism. And again, ESAs have no effect on iron metabolism. And the lack of an effect on iron metabolism is in fact the biggest barrier to the effectiveness of ESAs in the hyporesponsive patients who remain functionally iron deficient. So with the hip stabilizers and the fact that you're transcribing a number of genes that relate to improved iron absorption and improved iron release from storage and improved iron mobilization to the bone marrow, you're getting a much more coordinated erythropoietic response, which explains why the hip stabilizers in general and Roxadustat in particular, based on the data that we now have from global clinical trials and specifically also country-wide trials in China, are more effective than ESAs in the hypo-responsive patient, typically those with the elevated CRP levels. So again, this is an unmet need. Patients on dialysis who don't respond to ESAs, here we have a better mousetrap because the hip stabilizers overcome that functional iron deficiency and allow the iron to get to the bone marrow where it's needed. So does this mean that we're going to see a complete move away from IV iron in dialysis? Well, no, it, it, there'll be a decrease in IV iron requirements. And that was demonstrated in the uh, global phase three studies of Roxudus that, that were presented at ASN Kidney Week, that there was a significant reduction in IV iron requirements, but it wasn't eliminated altogether. There also may be a greater ability to absorb oral iron, both in dialysis and non-dialysis patients. And we don't have these data yet, but based on my understanding of the physiology of the hip stabilizers on these iron mobilization proteins, it's very likely that many patients who previously did not respond to oral iron because of poor absorption may now respond to the oral iron, and that may save IV iron infusions among non-dialysis CKD patients and even home dialysis patients, PD and home hemo. 
Okay. Wow. I mean, these all sound like a lot of different benefits. Tell me about the scenario where an ESA is still going to be preferred over a HIF pH inhibitor. Well, I, I think you could take the position if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> so, you know, you have that, you know, 80% of prevalent dialysis patients who are doing fine on ESAs. You know, they're achieving their target hemoglobin level on a modest uh, ESA dose, and there's no reason to, to change what they're, they're doing. So, you know, I, I see, you know, except for the hyporesponsive patients and the incident patients, that there'll probably be a certain amount of inertia in continuing to treat those patients with ESAs because they're, they're doing fine. Okay, fair enough. Let me ask you this. Let's shift gears a little bit. And I want to ask you about the Vatidustat um, data in non-dialysis. Uh, that's presented at, at ASN. Does, do the results of that trial have any of impact on, on the class or the way you're thinking about the, the different HIFs? Yes, I, I think they do. I, I think this is demonstration that not all HIFs are created equal, so to speak. Uh, there, we know that there are different properties of the different HIF stabilizers. There's different pharmacokinetic properties in terms of their half-life and their frequency of administration. And there's also different properties in terms of their specificity for the various prolyl hydroxylase domain enzymes. So there's three prolyl hydroxylase domains, and we know that certain prolyl hydroxylase domains are more specific to HIF-2, which is the HIF that is more uh, related to erythropoiesis and iron metabolism. So the specificity for the prolyl hydroxylase domains uh, may give you a more targeted effect on erythropoiesis and less of an off-target effect on other hypoxia-responsive uh, enzymes or, or genes, I should say. So that's one thing. The other, as I said, is the pharmacokinetics. So Roxidustat has the longest half-life and is normally administered three times a week. Vatazustat and Daprotostat have shorter half-lives and are administered daily. Uh, Vatazustat and Daprotostat both had, had had phase two studies where they've been administered three times weekly in dialysis patients. And they, and they seem to work okay, but their native pharmacokinetics is clearly a shorter half-life requiring a more frequent dose. So again, when you talk about the drug specificity that you're looking for with the HIF stabilizer. What you're trying to do is stimulate certain genes that are related to erythropoiesis, but not stimulate other genes that are, that are part of the cellular response to hypoxia, but you don't want to stimulate because they have to do with altered cellular metabolism or angiogenesis or fibrosis or other things that occur in a hypoxic environment. Remember the HIF stabilizers are basically mimicking a hypoxic environment, but you only want to do that insofar as stimulating erythropoiesis and not anything else. And it may very well be that the longer half-life and longer dosing interval of roxudostat allows for more of a reset of these gene transcriptions that then minimizes the transcription of off-target genes and gives you the greatest specificity for the on-target genes. Now that's purely theoretical, but it goes to the point that, as I said, these are different agents. I don't think we can any longer look at them in terms of, you know, one size fits all, they're all class effect, they're interchangeable. I don't think that's the case now based on the Vatidustat results. So let me ask you, um, there was some sub-analysis presented looking at the U.S. population versus ex-U.S. population and different hemoglobin targets, suggesting that maybe some of the myths had to do with targeting higher hemoglobin. What, what is your thought around that? Well, that's always been an issue with the ESAs that the, we now have, you know, many studies that show that targeting higher hemoglobin levels is associated with more adverse cardiovascular and mortality outcomes. You know, go back to the, the normal hematocrit study, the CHOIR, the CREATE, the TREAT study. Pretty much every one of those studies showed that targeting higher hemoglobin levels was not a good thing more cardiovascular events. And it varied from study to study which events, but, you know, the lesson was clearly learned. So mm -hmm. as a result, the FDA responded with a fairly restrictive package insert for ESAs with a target hemoglobin of around 10 to 11 for, for most patients, whereas the European regulatory authority was not quite as restrictive and their ESA package insert uh, allowed for a target hemoglobin of 10 to 12. So when Vatidustat did its studies, 
it basically used as its comparator group in non-dialysis CKD, the protocol from that particular region based on the ESA label. Okay, so in the United States, the ESA label said target 10 to 11. So the ESA treated patients were targeted to 10 to 11 and the VAT induced that patients were targeted to 10 to 11. In non-USA, the label said target 10 to 12 with ESAs. So both the control with the ESA and the VAT induced that were targeted to 10 to 12. This was shown by the outcomes of efficacy that the patients in the United States did in fact achieve a lower mean hemoglobin level of almost half a point uh, right. in the U.S. versus those in Europe. So the question remains, you know, did that higher target hemoglobin level result in the safety signals that we saw with Vatidustat? And the answer is maybe, but mm -hmm. you also have to remember that we're talking about the, the safety signals as compared to the control group, okay? Mm -hmm. Not the absolute number of events, but the events in relation to the control group. So mm -hmm. the question that still remains is, yes, Europe had a higher target hemoglobin level and probably used more Vatidustat and more ESA to get there, but why was there the difference between the Vatidustat and the, the control ESA treated patients that did not achieve non-inferiority? So mm -hmm. again, I, I think it's much more complex than the higher achieved hemoglobin level and maybe even the higher Vatidustat that, that was used to get there. So my last question on the Vatidustat is they had a positive trial in dialysis, strong, strong data there. Does the failed trial in non-dialysis influence your thought about the product in the dialysis setting or do you think of these as totally different settings? I, I think they're totally different settings. And, you know, I think back to what happened with peganesetide, which is the perfect mm -hmm. metaphor here. Okay, so peganesetide had the same problem. Uh, mm -hmm. They did a study, peganesetide, for those of you who don't remember, uh, <laughs> was the pegylated polypeptide uh, that was basically an erythropoiesis analog. So it was a non-biologic, it was actually made in a in a test tube, uh, did not require cold storage and had a number of advantages compared to ESA, is a lot cheaper to produce and therefore significantly less expensive in terms of acquisition cost. Um, and when they did the studies for dialysis and non-dialysis patient with ESA as the comparator, there was no safety difference in the dialysis population, and then there was a safety signal as compared to ESA in the non-dialysis population. Exactly the same thing as what happened to Vatidustat, and nobody could ever explain it. You know, mm -hmm. how many years later are we, and they still haven't figured out why that happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what concerns, let's assume Roxidustat is approved, let's assume other uh, hip PHIs come onto the market. What concerns are you going to have? What should nephrologists be looking for as these drugs start to be used in a real world population? Well, I, I think we start with the phase three clinical trials and we look at as many sub analyses as are available because, you know, these are nuanced. You know, you, you, tr you try to get the big picture, sure, but when you're actually treating patients with a drug, you want to know as much about a drug as possible. So you keep your eye out for all the sub-analyses and things that come, you know, at national meetings and in the literature, et cetera, to figure out, you know, what you can expect when you treat patients with these agents. I think Roxa so far looks pretty good, okay? You know, safety signal, no worse than ESAs in dialysis patients, maybe less in incident dialysis patients, no worse than placebo in non-dialysis patients, which I think is, uh, you know, pretty impressive. Uh, and to me, that is a good start. So, you know, I do plan to start using Roxidustat in my non-dialysis patients and in my ESA hyporesponsive patients when it's available, because I think it's a better mousetrap. Uh, as the other agents start to enter the market, I think we need to look at their individual data, but we are not going to have head-to-head -head studies, I mean, for many, many years. So mm -hmm. it's going to be very, very difficult to say with any certainty that one agent is either superior or inferior to another in, among the HIF stabilizers, you know, without head-to-head. -head. So you just kind of have to draw what you can from the studies that are against the, mostly ESA comparators to try to decide, you know, which is going to be the safest and most 
uh, effective drug. I don't think efficacy is going to be an issue. I think they're mm -hmm. all effective when used in the appropriate doses. So really what it's going to boil down to in terms of our decision making, once all these agents do reach the market is price, because, you know, in the non CKD, or I should say the non-dialysis world, we're still going to be slaves to prior authorization <laughs> and what's on the formulary of the payer. And to a certain extent that may you know, influence our decision making to a greater degree than we would like. And to a certain extent, that's also going to be true in the dialysis units. I think mm -hmm. most of the dialysis chains are going to have a single HIF stabilizer on their formulary. And that's probably going to be going to be driven by, you know, uh, some kind of, you know, purchasing, you know, issues with regards to price or incentives or whatever it is that they do at that level. And then we're going to be pretty much uh, using that particular agent. So unfortunately, at least from my point of view, much of this, this decision making may be taken out of our hands, you know, once all these agents are out there, because there will be a perception that they are all interchangeable, which I don't think that they are. But nonetheless, <laughs> that's probably what's going to happen with these agents, just like it happens with every other class. If you're locked into using one specific HIF brand in the dialysis setting, are you going to be more likely to use that same HIF in non-dialysis or again? No, not necessarily. No. You know, okay. I, I think Roxa do that because of its three times a week dosing seems to be more of a natural for the dialysis population. Uh, but in the non-dialysis population, maybe a daily drug could be preferred because many patients might find it easier to put one pill in each slot of their, mm -hmm. you know, pill sorter rather than having to remember, oh, do I put it in the every alternate one? Is it is today Monday and do I take it or is it Tuesday and I don't take it? A drug that you take every single day may actually be better for patients than one that you take three times a week uh, in, in terms of patient friendliness. And in COVID world, who knows what day it is anymore? <laughs> well, as well. That's true. They all kind of seem the same. <laughs> so my last question for you, um, when, when you think about the potential for Roxidustat to be approved, are you most excited about it in dialysis or in non-dialysis? Well, I, you know, I'm not sure I, I want to make a choice there because I'm, oh, <laughs> I'm actually excited about it. That's why it's my settings. last question. <laughs> if, I, if I had to pick which setting I'm most excited, it would be non-dialysis because those patients are clearly undertreated for their anemia. I mean, we know from all kinds of data uh, from USRDS in terms of 27, 28, you know, where you have to check out, did this patient receive ESAs and what was their hemoglobin when they started on dialysis, that our dialysis patients uh, enter, or I should say our patients enter dialysis woefully undertreated for their anemia. And I think part of that is due to the user unfriendliness of ESA injections. Uh, mm -hmm. They're hard to prescribe, they're hard to administer, the patients don't like getting shots, and as a result, I think we're, we're really dropping the ball on adequately treating anemia in our pre-dialysis patients. So I think a new approach with an oral drug and hopefully one that you know, patients can easily access, that there aren't gonna be too many barriers in terms of you know, prior authorization and other things that make it less accessible to the patient will bring more effective therapy to this population. And I can't help but think that they're gonna feel better and that rocky first four months of dialysis where they're starting with hemoglobins of nine won't be so rocky if they're starting with hemoglobins of 10 or 10 and a half. Well, that is great perspective. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, always a pleasure. And uh, we will look forward to seeing how this plays out in March. Thanks, Jennifer. Have a great night. Great talking Thanks. to you. You Bye -bye. too.